Okay, cool. Um, so I mentioned, oh, hang on, we need to do the whole thing. Yeah, are we good? Are we running? That's, that's cool. Awesome. So, um, yes, this, this block I particularly, specifically targeted as a discussion conversation because the rest of the day is bound to come up with comments, ideas, um, frustrations, and <laughs> people who need to say things, and then we can have a, a proper conversation about that while we're all together. Of course, there's the rest of the week, but it's nice to get to know each other a little bit better and, um, and hash out some ideas, possibly even. So, who would who would like to say something? So, I have, um, That's the rule. You, you can't speak before you're holding the thing, and if you speak, no one things. else you can. can. Talk when you've got it. And I'll shut up. Does that work? <laughs> um, so, it's sort of related to uh, what you were saying before about school resourcing and how stressed teachers are. I'm not a teacher. My wife is a teacher. She's a Year 12 chemistry teacher and teaches science in the junior years at a government regional college in Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, I have to take stress leave for her because I mean, she comes home and is absolutely stressed out and talks yeah. about her day. I get stressed, and so I have to take leave as well. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm here for a week. But my question is um, related to that, the stress and uh, the total lack of time that teachers have, and you mentioned briefly, I think, that we have to change that. But how do you change that? Um, in a, in, so in, in this school, for example, um, they have one and a half IT technology people on staff for about 100 odd teaching staff and 800 yes. odd kids. So they're flat out just keeping printers running all day, every day. Uh, her laptop is, is, she has admin because I told them, told her to ask for it, but it's, it's a very limited admin on a Windows laptop. And the group policy has switched off the firewall, for example, because it's easier for IT to support a laptop that doesn't have a firewall on it which means when she's on open Wi-Fi at McDonald's or anywhere else, her education department issued laptop is totally vulnerable to everything. Yeah. How do we... Which state is this? Victoria. Okay. How do is we... McDonald's she goes to? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> moving on. Don't worry. Uh, so it's, it's really a policy question. Uh, how, yes. do you, um, how do you change mm. a government and even at the school level, because each school has their own IT budget, so they don't have... You know, Depends on the school. Yeah, so, yes. so in this case, a government regional college, they yes. have their own IT budget and they're focused on printers sure. and staff and yeah. not focused on hiring another IT person to help out the staff get IT working properly. Okay. How do you change that? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, toss, I'll toss a couple of ideas in there which I've come to so far, um, which deals with the stress part. Um, seeing subjects as separate is in a major chunk due to the standardized um, tests and assessments that kind of demand magic numbers to show up for literacy and numeracy in particular. If schools were less stressed about that, and I realize that that's a bit of an if and I need to get to the other topic, um, that would be less of a problem. Um, so the main thing is it would be great if we got rid of that stress about the standardized testing in NAPLAN. NAPLAN is not being used for what it was designed to do. The designers of NAPLAN have actually stated that. The idea is to measure where kids are at so that it's a tool for the teacher to see if they're ahead behind or whatever. Now, technically, a competent teacher, which most of them are, is quite capable of actually assessing that just in the classroom by working with the kids every day. They know the kids really, really well. This standardizes that and gives policymakers also an idea of how things are going. And that, to a point, is valuable. So I'm not anti-NAPLAN here. I want to make that clear. However, the way NAPLAN has now progressed is though the results are now published in the newspapers and it's being used as a judgment thing for teachers. If a year five teacher has a lower score from the previous year, and remember that's a different class, and it drops one or two points, all hell breaks loose because, oh heck, the NAPLAN scores have, have dropped. No, they haven't. It's a different cohort and they will behave slightly differently. It's Not a problem. It's yeah, exactly. Itself. So it's that kind of thing. If that kind of stressed testing were to chill out, that would be really beneficial for the overall thing. At that point, you can start integrating subjects 
and integrating subject, subjects saves a lot of time because are you doing, there are now schools that say, no, if you're reading a text as part of history, you're not doing reading comprehension because that is literacy and that is a different subject. And this makes for a problem because then they need to spend time reading the, the history text, but they also need to spend time on the reading comprehension again. That's silly. Of course it's the same thing. Whenever you're reading, you're doing literacy. Whenever you're using some maths, you're doing mathematics. And it may be that you're doing mathematics while doing history. That's entirely feasible. But, you know, it, it's, a, it's a thing where possibly parents need to change what they ask the teachers and the school. Uh, for instance, there's plenty of research indicating that at least in primary school, giving homework does squat for outcomes. A school where you don't do um, homework has equal or better outcomes. However, parents ask a school to please give their pumpkins homework. And that's a problem, even though the school at the same time says, we're doing evidence-based things. Well, yes and no, it, it, it's, it's a problem. So that, that kind of, you know, I've, I've kind of brought up a couple of things that I'm pretty sure people now are nodding and having opinions on. Let's, be, let's be take that up. In, in education, there are it's what tricky. we call wicked problems. Do you know yes. what a wicked problem is? No, I think so, evilly. It's evil, yeah. yeah. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a really obvious one I tell my student teachers. And one is, we aspire for nothing but excellence. Hmm. We learn from failure. So I fail often, and then you realise you've got this tension between the two of them. Yeah. How, what are we, where are we heading? And that's a wicked problem, and the education's littered with it. Yeah. But we've got some good questions here. Um, can I, here we go. Okay. So what you were talking about before and, and the answer that you gave about that, like, like the, the biggest problems that we face in education are all political problems. Yeah. They're to do with, um, this, as you say, that overemphasis on standardised testing, which is just driving, you know, kids to, you know, incredible levels of stress and teachers to incredible levels of stress. And of course, um, the inequalities in resource funding um, that in particular, you know, the, the public sector is facing and the increasing need to be equipping our students with digital literacy and digital technology skills, and yet the lack of funding for both the technology to work and the teachers to have those skills to learn, to know how to embody those and to teach, even with um, using, you know, the existing technology, let alone planning for technology to come. Mm. So all of those things are political things, but um, so my question, I guess, is what can we do within those limitations to try and make things uh, better? And what I'm really interested in is, you know, equipping teachers in particular with the knowledge to help them with the, you know, within the digital technology realm that they have to encounter in their own school. That's a good question it's about um, what we can do better with the funds that we have. Yep. Um, I, I just wanted to, to defend the Napline ecosystem for, for a bit, um, not just because part of it's my fault. Um, in year nine, 10% of kids can't read. Um, and, and talking about wanting to improve digital technology and, and that kind of thing, I mean, I, I volunteer in classes in any given class, three or four kids can't read. Yep. We can't teach them. It, we can't do it. And, and this is grade nine. Grade 10, if they haven't learnt to read by grade nine, they're not going to learn to read in grade 10. They're not going to read, learn to read grade, by grade 12. I, uh, I, I mean, digital technology is very, very important, but saying that NAPLAN is the problem is is avoiding the fact that NAPLAN is highlighting that, that we have this serious issue. It's highlighting that, that in a lot of schools it's not really improving a great deal. And, and, and while I acknowledge that a lot of the 
things that people are doing to try and fix it are not positive and not working, the reason we know that is because we have the NAPLAN tests showing us that what they're doing is not positive and not working. And, and getting rid of that data, I don't think is the solution. No, that, that, that's why I mentioned, I think the NAPLAN data is valuable when used for that particular purpose, picking out the essentials, because the knowledge that would be already available from an individual teacher are now visible at a higher level. However, when the numbers get published in a newspaper and this school has a slightly higher aggregate score over classrooms and year levels than another school, therefore it's a better school, because Mr. Murdoch says so, then we have a problem. And then when the minister stresses out about those numbers and says, oh, we must do so-and-so, you can call that a knee-jerk reaction, but it really causes a lot of damage because then doing more literacy and numeracy in the school doesn't help those particular kids that actually need the extra help, while the other kids who have less trouble with it are actually spending time on something they already you know, quite comfortable with and they will get bored and they're actually missing out on other things like maybe digital tech, maybe art, maybe something else. I know of high schools where in some cases the beautiful music program that was award winning was threatened with being ditched and essentially got ditched about eight years ago um, because the school wanted to focus more on, on core subjects as they called it then. Now that was wound back after a huge outcry from parents as well as actually um, students who wrote to the principal and got together and talked with the PNC and so on. And of course it's a fact that, that you know, music actually helps with things like mass and actually helps the brain development and so on. But the, you know, the basic thing is NAPLAN is a really good tool when not abused. I'm now hearing from, from parents, maybe it's gone too far with the bad PR, maybe it will get ditched. You know, as in, again, maybe a knee-jerk reaction once it actually blows up. I don't know. Um, but the basic tool is good. It's just getting used in the wrong way. It's interesting. It's, it's not a zero-sum game. You can yeah. do both. Yeah. And I know that um, the two, someone can correct this because I think the research is out there, there are two major links with the NAPLAN results that show direct correlation. One was um, um, drinking while pregnant, prenatal and school alcohol um, fetal alcohol. Oh, we, right, okay. it's, it's, yeah. it's what we don't talk about, but um, is a direct correlation. Another one is the number of books at home. Yes. And now, when you look at that, we don't yes. rectify that problem by doubling the amount of English at school. I yes. didn't read at school. I may have learned to analyse text. I learned to socialise. I learned to do a number of things around the reading program. But I became a, an avid reader because of the books I kept at home and part of that family culture. And that's yes. a lot harder to gain traction with. So you can do the IT and you can do some of the coding and you can do some of the exploration and it's not a zero-sum game. It's not like you, you have to do one or the other. If we've got a problem of obesity, we don't solve it by just increasing by an hour a week the amount of PE that the kids might be doing. We, do, we are actually. <laughs> <laughs> my, my year eights and year ten Smurfs now have to do an extra block of HPE even though it wasn't in the previous years of that same year level. It's now just been added in, in high, and that's, there's, a, there's a couple of different high schools in Brisbane, it's just been added in because there is a concern of obesity levels rising and kids not moving enough, therefore the minister has decided to give this directive and so on and so but forth. Remember and schools that's how are not vocational institutions, they're social ones no, no, and no. there's a very, <laughs> lot, there's a lot to say for the relationship that the yeah. teacher will have with the student and with the family and when you eat into their time, as you said, with stress, then you're going to undermine that yeah. relationship and the outcomes are going to be less. Mm -hmm. um, I keep hearing NAPLAN too. Not everything that we measure matters, and not everything that matters can be measured. Yes. I think I've heard you say, was it creativity, innovation, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship? Are they on the yeah. NAPLAN test? <laughs> well, Singapore rate them as being the things that we should be looking for. Yeah. yeah. So we don't have to be driven by the test, do we? So the, the, other, the other issue. Um, I'm awesome. yeah, yeah, so so I, I, I love data. Data's awesome. I, I like the data that we get out of NAPLAN, but I, I don't like the fact that it doesn't actually do anything. The, 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 thus far, the way, the strategies I've seen to improving your NAPLAN score and thus ensuring that your school has students in the next year and that your, you as a teacher don't get docked funding um, is, okay, well, let's focus on English and maths because that's NAPLAN. Let's focus on English and maths. And if we're looking at students who are in year nine and can't read, 
spending, you know, that instead of 20% of the time, spending 30% of the time doing English is not going to make them able to read. They, they need better support and intervention. And instead, we have a number that we can point out and say, see, these teachers are doing a bad job, bad teacher. Uh, yes, the, um, uh, the, the what is being done about it is, um, I, I think, quite deficient. The, the what that the, the I've observed in the school that I volunteer at is far more about behavioural management from what I've seen than um, addressing the problem. Um, I just, I, I keep hearing from people that NAPLAN is the problem. And, and, and I just wanted to say, NAPLAN isn't the problem. The problem is that kids can't read. Sure. Um, yeah. And NAPLAN is just highlighting that. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm a computer programmer. I, I don't do all this politics stuff. Um, I, I recognise that the politics and the, the administrative thing is a big human system with lots of moving parts. and. Some of it's codified and some of it's not. Um, a lot of what I see is not codified. The teachers in my local school, we have a school of 20 students, no, 12 now, um, with one or two teachers. And it's very remote and rural. Mm -hmm. um, and they certainly do not have the time or the resources to do anything except maybe get the kids to read. And the adults, who are all mostly farmers and contractors in the farming industry, don't demonstrate reading or writing as a skill. Uh, they do demonstrate mobile phone usage now, so that's a good start. Is it? So I, I would prefer not to fight City Hall. Yeah. Um, I don't have any luck anyway. <laughs> yes, I don't think I'd have any luck. And so what my wife and I do is we go into the school um, once a week for an hour and teach the kids something. Um, we sort of exhibit and exude technological competence. We make it fun. We use Arduinos and LEDs. We got them to build a torch last year out of parts. Um, we use those little cues and airs for explaining uh, the idea of making numbers and structures and things. Um, I'd like to know what interesting ways there are to bypass this broken system and to contribute locally. I don't know how much of this qualifies as being productive and how much of it qualifies as griping, but um, uh, my kids are going through high school. Um, I don't think it's a matter of how much you spend on IT, but how you spend it. The school spent a steaming bucket load of money on laptops with a vendor that doesn't even think about giving you a, um, a discount when you buy 700 of the rotten things. Sorry, 1,500 of them. 700 of which failed with the same problem, which the vendor did not acknowledge and replace. You're allowed to mention vendors. I'm allowed to mention vendors? Oh, yes. Apple. OK. I spent Clear. God knows how many hours of my life calling up and being polite and then increasingly narky until I got my okay. son's laptop replaced well, and now there's only 699 to go. <laughs> <laughs> moving on. Anyway, yes, but so it's, it's, I think I'm, I'm allowing this because I think it's important to call out. We don't need to be politically correct on such nonsense. I mean, if, if bad things happen, I think we need to mention it and yeah, yeah. keep going. No, I mean, okay, so, so they got a laptop. My son still has a bag that would make a Sherpa blush full of textbooks. Yes. And the textbooks that are on the laptop are DRM encrusted and worthless. Yes. And if I had a small team of experts to help me try to sabotage my son's education, I could not have come up with a better solution than a laptop. <laughs> because it is an amazing source of distractions for when he's trying to do work. Yes. So this is my gripe, and I'm now going to try to be positive. <laughs> But as for what to do with it, I, I, I've also done the try to go to schools and, and uh, I've had a lot more luck with the younger years where I think the pressure wasn't quite that insanely stupid. And just doing stupid stuff like making pepper aeroplanes or having a tug of war with the kids with a block and tackle to show that, you know, three kids can beat me and stuff like that. It's great fun, but I never did it properly like you do. 
integrating into the curriculum and making life easier for the teacher. Yes, it's making my life harder there. And I still have another company that actually pays the bills. Not there yet. Um, it is, that, that is growing now. Um, what I'd like to mention in this context, which may be helpful, is from experience so far, it seems that, first of all, it's easier to work with and in primary schools than it is to work with high schools. That comes back to the earlier thing where the primary schools don't have specialist teachers, the high schools have all these silos that you then need to interact with, and it becomes a different political problem. The second thing is that overall, state schools appear to be the easiest to work with, and next to that are, I think, Catholic schools. The reason for that is that state schools, they do have independence, but they operate in a certain environment, that, and you know, that they, they can do those things. The private schools are quite stuck in their ideas in many ways, and whether that's a primary school or a college that goes all the way to year 12, they've come up with a grand plan of what they're going to do. They've acquired the latest technology. They might have a $15,000 NEO, um, you know, those, those robots, or acquire two because it's cool, and not a, no conversation is going to get them away from that track. Therefore, it's, I, I easily put that in the two hard baskets and go back to my favorite primary schools. So, you know, if you, if you want to attack in that sense anything, please go to the local primary schools and do little things like, like what you, you, you were saying, your name is James. Um, what James was saying, you know, going into the school and, and doing a bit of a science, science project with, with Arduino or other, other things. I think that is fabulous and I think that is exactly the right thing because it teaches... It, it practices the skill for the kids in terms of problem solving, critical thinking, and all those skills that we were talking about that are important for digital technologies, but also just for the general world. That is how we solve problems and that's how we operate in the real world. So I think that's critical. You helped equip those kids better for later operating in high school, going to university and going out to, you know, either be a farmer or something else. That is a very, very good skill. Um, and of course the issue is, a school is not the only place where children learn. And as, um, as Roland mentioned earlier, literacy is directly related to the number of books that are present in the home. It doesn't have to be... The funny thing is, it doesn't matter how much the parents read in front of the kids or whether they read to the kids. It just seems to be a correlation with the number of books that are around the home. It's a really curious thing, but it works. But we can't directly influence homes Buy from schools books. or politically. Free books. What's that, sorry? Would you like to... Just, just, just put books in every house. Just we up. can just put books in every house, that's right. Benjamin it's Franklin. Sorry. Yes, the, the free library is Benjamin Franklin, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, um, he had the right idea, and this is long ago. Well, I, 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 Benjamin Franklin had the heresy of actually creating the world's first public library, and people said it wouldn't last. People would steal all the books <laughs> and sell them. Yes. Just getting way off topic, but I was going to say, uh, in reply to that one quickly, uh, there's like a free library thing at the moment, sort of like really in the Bay Area, um, where oh, yeah. you sort of set up books, huge problem with stealing. Everyone steals the books all the time. Um, I think it's only the presence of a librarian that actually stops people from stealing from a library. However, I was going to reply before to um, what you were saying about laptops in school being a distraction. Um, while I think that's true, I think it's not a bad thing. Um, the, the amount of sort of you know, literacy, computer literacy and ability to do things I've seen of uh, classes that do um, have laptops and classes that don't is, is amazing. And it's, like the ones that actually give out um, laptops where the kids have admin rights versus iPads, it's amazing how much more competent the kids are um, yes. when they have full admin rights on the computer because they can actually do things and they have to fix stuff themselves instead of giving it to someone um, or, or, or whatever yes. it is. So it's um, and, and which the amount is of the cause and which is the effect. No, they, they break it and then they fix it but and then they learn because they broke. You know, like they learn what not to do, and then they learn also how to fix it. Um, I, I think that's, that's hugely valuable. Um, but at the same time, it's you know, an opportunity for m most kids to get out of a pre-constructed environment. And I, I think that there's a bit too much of an emphasis on um, sort of, I suppose, learning tools and not sort of, the f sort of giving the full set of tools. Um, you, you know, this is like, there's like baby versions of everything. Like, why isn't it the full version? And then you know, maybe classes that actually, not classes or textbooks yeah. or something to, to, to do that. Um, 
So I, I was, I was ref so that's a slight reference you're, to... You're essentially asking why are the computers locked down rather than okay. being yeah. fully capable. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I that's the summary. Okay. Yeah, Sylvia yeah. Martinez and Gary Steger ran a group like that called um, Generation Yes, and it was about empowering kids to become the tech angels and to actually support. Yes. And the admin writes, well, really, the worst thing would happen, we'd have to wipe your laptop and start again. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then when something goes wrong, let's go and re-image the whole thing. But you, it is a change in the way that um, you see this infrastructure. It's not a corporate, but as a kid with a laptop in a school. And unfortunately, it's a corporate model. It's often said, this is how we do an in industry. Um, anyway, um, you had your hand? Yeah. yeah. I wanted to sort of follow up from what you were saying. Uh, in response to the laptops for a distraction thing, I feel like I don't know if there's any studies or research on this, and I don't know what the results would be if there were. But personally, just as a gut reaction, I feel like these are realistic distractions that you need to wrestle with on a day-to-day -day basis when you're an adult, and it feels like a, a good thing to teach people how to do that from a young age. Yes, um, and the kids have phones. The, kid, the kids have phones too. I, th I think I need to wrap up the conversation because we need to get the lighting talks um, going. Yeah, just as a, yeah, as IT it. professionals, remember too, there's teaching with the technologies, there's teaching about the technology. Yes. The teach the teach about technology are tech savvy. We know how to minimise distractions. You can have um, solitaire. When you're playing it, it tells me I'm not engaging enough, not that I need to remove solitaire. For the teachers who are teaching with the technology, they need the professional training and support, and as you indicated, they're not getting that. And it makes it really hard when yes. you don't have that exposure. We're in our own classrooms. It's not like we meet for a couple of hours a week to debrief about our tech skills. Some of them just found the technology dumped on them and then locked out. So it's, it's, it's tough for them. But there are two different things there. There's teaching with the technology, teaching about the technology. Yes. And they're not done by the same person. Um, there have been studies done regarding use of technology, things like laptops and iPads in, in and, and let's say generically tablets in classes. Um, particularly in America, essentially there has been a wave of iPad use and it's not, not just leveled off, it's plummeting. The number of sales has dropped and the use in schools have dropped and schools are actually completely removing iPads from the classroom use. As it turns out, the presence of technology in the classroom does not improve outcomes. It doesn't hinder outcomes as such either. It doesn't make squat of a difference per se. It can be used to improve outcomes, but the mere presence of the technology doesn't help that. So a good teacher can make a big difference without the technology. A good teacher using technology can make a big difference also. It's very similar to, for instance, public and private schools. Private schools do not create better outcomes. Over a long-term study, you end up with very similar outcomes. They just do things slightly differently, and there are very good private schools and the very bad private schools, and similarly the very good and bad public schools, depending on your criteria. But the, the key thing for me, and, and that comes back to what Thomas was saying, um, Yes, there are now 1,600 or 1,500 laptops in that school. Are they actually benefiting the outcomes, which I would regard as do we create capable young adults from that using those 1,500 times $1,500 lifetime? Yeah, that 1,500 times 1,500 is a couple of million dollars. That's a lot of money. Are we actually improving the outcome? I don't think so. Therefore, we need to do something else. I'm not saying we should ditch the laptops. But we need to reconsider how important they are and whether every kid needs to have one. Sure. Um, Final word you have. James Cameron, one laptop per child. Yes. We make them cheaper so that you can get around that problem. Sure. Spend the rest of the money on textbooks. We well, no, 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 no. prefer open textbooks. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, yeah. We give the child root access and yes. we give them a very quick way of reflashing. Yes. And we expect them to break. We yes. expect them to break their software in wonderful ways. Thank you. That's an awesome example, the OOPC approach of having it completely open. If you mm, break the whole thing, yes. we'll just re-image it rather than lock it down. I think that's an excellent example. I think the fundamental problem underneath this is what I would call functional overload. You can't learn how to play and learn how a car works if your family only has one car. Yes. Because if you break it, you're stuffed. If you only have one toilet and you need to learn how a toilet works, that's a problem. So any mm -hmm. situation where you only have one of something to learn on doesn't work. So yeah. whenever I buy a new circuit board or a chip or something, I always buy two because I want to be able to break it and learn <laughs> how I broke okay. it. So 
What happens in schools, and I've seen it, is laptops become integral to single sign-on, to submitting assignments, to sitting tests, to doing practically everything that, that the IT department can come up with to do. That prevents them from being used for learning technology. And the same thing happens with phones. Okay. I think that's a very good point to finish on. Thanks. We need to continue discussion. with the... Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Please do continue the conversation the rest of the week. Just we need to wrap up the official part of that. Yes, with that. Yes.